Um, does anybody have a sense of what Tara's mantra means before I go into it? A general idea? Om Tari Tu Tari Turi Soha means generally what do you think? Okay, so you've got Om. Same Om as everybody's Om. What's Om? Body, speech, and mind, Buddhas. Yep, enlightened body, speech, and mind. Enlightened body, speech, and mind. So Om means the same thing always. Um, occasionally, Om is emphasizing purification of body. But when you're seeing it in a mantra, it's meaning, as Mary Ellen says, enlightened body, speech, and mind. And Om in the Tibetan characters, it's easier to see how it's made up of three syllables itself, A, U, and Ma. You know, if it's in English characters, it's just an O and an M. So it's harder to kind of convey that sense of body, speech, and mind. But when you see the Tibetan characters, you've got the A, and then you've got the little like wing thing, right? And then you got the little circle thing, and those are each syllables. Okay. All right, so we'll go into it. I won't put you on the spot anymore. So this is also from Andy's book. So here's the mantra garland. Um, and mantra garlands are depicted flat like this, but they're to be visualized three dimensionally. And sometimes you'll see the mantra garland within the mandala. And sometimes you'll just have it simple and 3D like this or simple in 3D like this. So when you're visualizing, you're trying to imagine that the syllables are facing inward as if you could read them. And that's why I'm having it moving so you can read them. But they're facing inward, not outward during the mantra recitation time. And light is going out, moving in and out, performing the two activities. So, Really, it's a stationary situation and the light is what's moving. But you have a sense that your vision is not trapped in one direction, that your vision is a 360 degree vision that can see all of the mantra simultaneously. But in the beginning, you can just think green light going out, green light coming in, you know, just a moon disc with a green circle around it. You can just keep it very simple and gradually build elaboration as you go. And so just straight across, Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Soha. Om signifies Tara's holy body, holy speech, and holy mind. And the Tare Tu Tare Ture contains the essence of the Four Noble Truths. So truth of suffering, truth of origin, truth of cessation, truth of path. So in a nutshell, it means the way to enlightenment is to understand the Four Noble Truths, to abandon the first two and develop the second two. That's the summary explanation, but then each one has detail. So Tare signifies release from samsara, meaning the female one who releases. So it's showing Tara's function. The help she gives us is to release us from samsara, thus freeing us from samsara. So she's not like doing this to us voluntar involuntarily, right? We can't be a passive participant in our own liberation, but by connecting with this energy, we have more momentum to break free. And then the big one is tutare. And the tutare is Tara freeing from the eight fears. And the eight fears are depicted as things that human beings find scary and are fearful of when really what we should be fearful of are negative states of mind because it's negative states of mind that cause harm to ourselves and others. So we marry the eight fears with eight situations or animals or things that normally scare us. And we talk about what should actually scare us so that we stop doing them. So this is from um, a prayer by the first Dalai Lama. Dwelling in the mountains of wrong views of selfhood, puffed up with holding itself superior. It claws other beings with contempt. The lion of pride, please protect us from this danger. So we're scared of lions when really we should be scared of pride. 
not tamed by the sharp hooks of mindfulness and vigilance, dulled by the maddening liquor of sensual pleasures. It enters wrong paths and shows its harmful tusks. The elephant of ignorance, please protect us from this danger. So we're afraid of crazed elephants who trample villages when really we should be afraid of our ignorance and what it does. Because because of our ignorance, we enter into wrong paths. We get dulled by sensual pleasures. We lose our mindfulness. Driven by the wind of inappropriate attention, billowing forth swil swirling smoke clouds of misconduct. It has the power to burn down forests of goodness, the fire of anger. Please protect us from this danger. So we're afraid of fire. And of course that makes sense to be, but really it's anger that is one of the worst things. What anger does is it burns our merit. It's like reverse purification. So it's like regretting your good things and destroying the seeds for happiness in the future. You know, we talk about purification, you know, clearing all of our negative karma so that we don't have to suffer. And then we've developed all of this good karma, which will lead to happiness, but you can actually burn your happy seeds as well. And the way you burn those is through anger. So we should be apprehensive of the habit of anger and be very much on top of not letting it take hold. And then lurking in the dark pit of ignorance, unable to bear the wealth and excellence of others. It swiftly injects them with its cruel poison. The snake of jealousy, please protect us from this danger. So our society values things like drive and ambition and competitiveness, but actually it destroys relationships. It means that we're always in comparison, that we're always assessing ourselves against others, rather than just assessing ourselves based on our own past self and looking at, am I better today than yesterday? It, it's uh, unhappy when others are doing well. It's just, it's such a destructive force in our life. So what we're saying is that sure, snakes are scary, jealousy is worse. And then roaming in the fearful wilds of inferior practice, and the barren wastes of absolutism and nihilism. They sack the towns and hermitages of benefit and bliss, the thieves of wrong views. Please protect us from this danger. So if you have wrong views, you're going to not know what to practice and not know what to abandon. You're gonna think that bad things are good. You're gonna believe, you know, some sort of weird pop psychology, cherry picking sort of religion that you patch together based on your own whims of the day and think that that's a valid path. And it's often at the cost of ethics, but it can also be at the cost of even worse, you can go into the nihilistic extreme and develop total apathy, total despair, total indifference, or you can become completely hedonistic and be totally fine with taking people for granted and acting in really harmful ways. So thieves are scary, wrong views are worse. And then binding embodied beings in the unbearable prison of cyclic existence with no freedom, it locks them in cravings tight embrace. The chain of miserliness, Please protect us from this danger. So when we have craving, when we have miserliness, it's like we're constricted. We are holding things so tightly. We feel such a deprivation mentality. And that I will not share, I cannot release, makes us feel like we're in prison. And so freeing up miserliness, having non-attachment, even moving into generosity, we shake off those bonds. And then sweeping us in the torrent of cyclic existence, so hard to cross, where conditioned by the propelling winds of karma, we are tossed in the waves of birth, aging, sickness, and death. The flood of attachment, please protect us from this danger. 
So we have attachment to cyclic existence itself and cyclic existence or uncontrolled rebirth is our own aggregates bound by karma and disturbing emotions. And so because of that, we have uncontrolled birth, uncontrolled aging, uncontrolled sickness, uncontrolled death, and then create more of the same by this terrible clinging and all forms of obsession really have this torrent like quality if you're just sucked under like the undertow of a wave you almost become helpless in the face of your own attachment the obsession just floods your mind so we're asking tara please protect us from this danger floods are scary attachments worse And then roaming in the space of darkest confusion, tormenting those who strive for ultimate aims. It is viciously lethal to liberation. The carnivorous demon of doubt, please protect us from this danger. So doubt eats our momentum. Doubt eats our fuel. Doubt throws up all of these obstacles in our way. But we're not talking about healthy questioning, good debates. Those are excellent. We definitely want to debate. We definitely want to question. The, the, the demon of doubt that's spoken of here is when you just will not let something go, even when you've found a good answer, because that answer means you're going to have to change. And change is hard. So you're going to nourish this doubt, even though you know it's silly, because the deep reality is you don't want to change. So, you know, we do this all the time. We do it with diets. We say, oh, this cheesecake's not so bad. I'll just continue to eat cheesecake forever. It won't lead to anything bad. I've lived this long. You know, we fool ourselves because we don't want to change. So this is the kind of doubt we're talking about that's um, not based in reason. It's not based in seeking truth. It's actually just stuck. So this tutare signifies dispelling these fears. It means the female one who cuts off or dispels the eight fears or dangers, stopping each inner fear, which is related to an outer fear. So ignorance is the danger of the elephant. Hatred is the danger of fire. Attachment is the danger of water or flood. Pride is the danger of the lion. Jealousy is the danger of the snake. Wrong view is the danger of the thief. Doubt is the danger of the demon, and miserliness is the danger of chains. So tutare helps clear all of those. It cuts off, dispels, protects. Just doing this mantra can help wake up our virtue to protect the mind from these things. And then ture signifies releasing from disease, not only the physical diseases that we ordinary beings recognize. Tara not only releases us from physical suffering, she also benefits by releasing sentient beings from mental diseases, the 84,000 diseases of the disturbed and unsubdued mind and its karmic actions. This shows the true cessation of suffering by actualizing the true path, realizing nirvana released from samsara, and then the enlightenment within one's own mind. And then soha or svaha is like, so be it. May the ideas take root and integrate. So most mantras contain om. And between om at the beginning and soha or whom at the mantra's end is the deity's specific meaning, which signifies the path. It contains the method and wisdom of the path. We actualize the method and wisdom by purifying our body, speech, and mind and becoming oneness with Tara. So when we're doing any mantra, it protects the mind. The meaning of the word mantra is that which protects the mind. All mantras protect the mind. And I think it's fascinating to even just experiment very casually without putting any pressure on yourself, you know, just quietly in a family dinner, om tari tu tari tu saha, om tari tu tari tu saha, under your breath so no one can hear. And just kind of like allow it to protect your mind from the normal things that you allow to aggravate it. It's like a preemptive strike. But then what it also does is that it brings in a healing component as well. 
And there have been interesting scientific studies about the power of Sanskrit words done in a mantra format that it actually does really interesting things to the brain. And that's just the brain. We're talking about the mind. And the mind is not physical. But it can help condition and train the mind towards the path to enlightenment. During the pandemic, His Holiness really emphasized that we do Chenrezig practice and Tara practice to help protect us, to help protect the world. And, you know, I think that so far so good, but you had to have um, created the causes in the past to link up with the condition of the mantra in the present. Yeah, and so this is where we wanna make sure we understand the difference between a substantial cause and a coactive condition. So if you've planted the seeds for health and well-being and robust immune system by practices such as saving life in, in this and previous lives, then when you say the mantra, it is like watering those seeds so that protective ability can awaken. So the, the Buddhas can't like sprinkle you with magic pixie dust and like protect you from suffering. What they can do is be an incredibly powerful condition to water the best seeds that you yourself already created. But you had to have created those seeds. But also by doing practices like this, you're planting positive seeds on your mental continuum for happiness and protection in the future. So it's just important to always remember that you cannot be a passive participant in your own enlightenment. Yeah, that it's always Buddha's mind and your mind coming together. You can't just sit there waiting and being like, you know, God save me, right? Be like involuntarily yoinked from samsara and plunked into Buddhahood. It doesn't work that way, right? But, you know, mantras are incredibly powerful. And so experiment and play with them and see they have power before you have the empowerment. They have more power once you've had the empowerment. They have even more power once you've done the retreat of that deity and the fire puja that accompanies it. So the more you do it, the more momentum it has and the more direct your relationship with that archetypal energy that the deity represents. So do you have any, any questions about the Tara mantra or mantras generally? I don't have any questions, but I found myself naturally um, when I get into the car and drive, I turn into a monster on the road and I'm, and I get angry at other drivers really quickly. And that's actually a big source of my practice is learning to minimize that. So I, I do do mantras. I do the Om Mani Padma Hum when I find myself starting to get angry at other drivers. And so is that what you're kind of talking about to sort of, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. How do use that? Well, and even do it as soon as you start driving, not waiting to get grumpy, because it might actually prevent you from getting grumpy. Well, know? what I do is I say to myself, I'm not going to get mad at anybody today <laughs> when I'm driving my car. That's how I start out the trip. <laughs> and, then and then I end up by reciting the mantra because I'm starting to get angry. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, practicing in ordinary situations is what we want to start being able to do. What you do on the cushion is like a concentrated form so that when you're off your cushion, it has enough oomph to carry through into your daily life. You know, like a launch sequence, you know, your cushion's like the launch sequence and then take off, right? But you needed a lot of momentum and fuel and energy down there before you stood up again to carry you through the day. So absolutely say mantras when you're driving, as long as it doesn't interfere with your focus for driving, you know, don't meditate on emptiness when you're driving, <laughs> but you know, definitely mantras. Absolutely. Or Tonglen, if you're stuck at a just traffic light and you're getting stressed, so getting, taking meditation. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a good one. Um, Mary Ellen. It's not just about but when you were saying that you have to be an active participant in your own enlightenment, right? After the visualization in, in the sadhana, um, you make the heartfelt prayer. It says, please remain above my head until I receive enlightenment. And most of the time you hear achieve enlightenment. So is yeah. there a, a subtle difference there? I would have to look at the Tibetan, but I'm guessing that was a, a translator foible, I'm guessing. 
or it does in fact say um, receive and it's, it's a tricky one. Like we've had this argument with the guru puja for years where we're saying compassionate protector or compassionate savior, because the word in Tibetan has the connotation of either. And to say protector sounds like you have power, but you need support, right? And savior sounds like I'm a victim, please save me, you know, to some people, right? But to some people, protector sounds kind of blocking and savior sounds empowering, you know? So it's, it's a tricky thing with English, but may I receive or please bestow upon me anything that has a reference to blessings or bestowal is really you asking that your mind transform. So it's asking for the most powerful conditions for the causes you've created to ripen. So whenever you say, please bestow on me blessings and realizations, they are not giving you blessings and realizations, but you're saying, I am open to, I am receptive to the best conditions I have the karma to receive. Yeah, and of course I've created those. So it's, it's a really good point and um, we will get tripped up just like the word um, for negativity is still sometimes translated as sin. And if you were brought up in a you know, Christian household with any kind of shaming vocabulary, sin goes right to the heart and you feel, oh God, not this word again. But if you were brought up by like friendly, liberal, progressive Christians like myself, sin just means you've missed the mark. You know, and so for me, it doesn't have any particular effect because I had groovy Methodists in my family and they were nice about the word. But for some people, it's just like an arrow to the heart, right? So we try and say negativity instead of sin, but some translators will insist on using that old word. So with so many things in Buddhism, the word choice is going to mean something different than it does conversationally. I mean, look at attachment, right? Like attachment theory and attachment parenting is all full of like connections and bonding and friendliness. Attachment in Buddhism is one of the worst things. It's one of the three poisons because it's exaggerating the good and building false expectations, right? So we have to learn what is the meaning under the word and not have a default assumption that it means what we're used to it meaning. So I'm, I'm glad you brought up that word because it, it keeps coming up. Yeah. Again and again in Buddhism, that word, we think we know what it means, means something different in Buddhism. Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks guys. Um, so please do try and do the Tara practice by yourself before we meet again. And tomorrow we'll do Tara Puja and more on 21 Taras and um, a bit on stupas and stuff like that. So appreciate your time and uh, we'll go ahead and dedicate. Jantu sam chorim poshe ma ke panam ke gyochi ke pan yam pa me pa hin ko ne gondu pa Tony Dawa Rinpoche, Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyochi, Ke Pan Yamba Me Bai, Kone Kon Tu Pawa Thanks, folks. See you tomorrow. And if you think of any questions, write them down. Thank you so much, Venerable. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.